All right, Crystal, what's on your radar? Well, as a true populist left rises in America, a new debate has been added to our national dialogue. Should billionaires exist? The conversation was kicked off when ta Coates asked AOC this question. Do you think it is moral for individuals to, for instance, do we live in a moral world that allows for billionaires? Is that a moral outcome in and no, of itself? Mm -hmm. it's not. Mm -hmm. um, it's not. And it's not. And I think it's, it's important to say that I, I, I don't think it's ne it, that necessarily means that all billionaires are immoral. It is right. not to say that someone like Bill Gates, for example, or Warren Buffett mm -hmm. are, are immoral people. I do not believe that. But I believe... Well, that he kicks his dog. Right. Like yeah. That. I, I, I don't... I don't... I'm not yeah. saying that. But I do think a system that allows billionaires to exist mm. when there are parts of Alabama where, where people are still getting ringworm because mm -hmm. they don't have access to public health mm -hmm. is wrong. Mm -hmm. The New York Times asked all the candidates who sat with them whether anyone deserves a billion dollars. CNN even got in on the action at a debate asking Sanders and then Steyer about whether Sanders was trying to tax billionaires out of existence. Bernie, of course, has directly and unequivocally declared that billionaires should not exist. Well, new TV ad spending numbers demonstrate perhaps more clearly than any other stat I've seen that no billionaires should not exist. Take a look at this. Here is how much every candidate spent on TV through December 17th. Bloomberg, who just jumped in the race a few weeks ago, has already spent $100 million. In other words, he spent enough money in terrible TV ads to house every homeless person in D.C. this year. The lesser billionaire, Tom Steyer, has already spent $81 million. The next biggest spender in TV ad buys is Bernie Sanders at a comparatively measly $8.6 million. Now, let's put this in perspective. No candidate in the history of the nation has ever had more grassroots fundraising success than Bernie Sanders in this election cycle. He's received a record-breaking 4 million-plus donations from more than a million individuals. Teachers, Walmart workers, Amazon warehouse workers all chipped in their 10 and 20 bucks to fund his campaign in historically unprecedented numbers. And yet, when compared to the billionaires, it is a drop in the bucket. It would take more than 5.5 million donations at his average amount of $18 to match just what Bloomberg spent in the first 23 days of his campaign. That's not to mention any additional dollars for staff and travel and digital ads and field programs and mail, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when you look at it through that lens and realize that even the most prolific grassroots fundraiser of all time cannot come close to matching the spending, it becomes completely obvious that the existence of billionaires is deeply destructive to our society and really to our entire self-concept and reality. The best aspiration, at least, of our nation's founding values is a democratic equality among citizens. The useful fiction we indulge is one citizen, one vote, that everyone's voice is represented in the power structures of our nation. When you have billionaires who can waltz into the presidential contest, either unknown in Steyer's case or deeply unpopular in Bloomberg's case, and then shift the entire direction of the contest and media coverage simply through their dollars alone, you know you have a massive problem. These are not citizens. They are oligarchs. And we all live at the mercy of their whims of when and where and how they exercise their power or show their benevolence. Now, it's been clear for a while that the rich have purchased our government, rendering democracy a sham. Several years back, political scientists analyzed legislative action to see who Congress was really serving. Was it ordinary citizens, interest groups, or economic elites? They found that while Congress was deeply responsive to the preferences of the rich and somewhat responsive to the needs of interest groups, they were not responsive at all to the preferences of ordinary citizens. You get that? You don't matter in Washington. No matter how many letters you write or town halls you show up at, if you aren't swimming with the Bloombergs and Steyers of the world, you don't influence what happens here one bit. Here are the charts that show what the researchers found. That completely flat line is how much ordinary citizens move the needle in D.C., and the upward slope is how much they succumb to the desires of economic elites. Ever wonder why D.C. is always trying to cut Social Security even though no non-elite has ever asked for that once? Well, now you know the answer. Now, there are multiple reasons for this dynamic, but one of the biggest ones is exactly the problem demonstrated with Bloomberg's ad spending. No matter how many ordinary Americans come together to back some proposal, they'll always be swamped and overwhelmed. But billionaire influence goes way beyond just political giving and spending. 
Let's consider Jeff Bezos, whose company will shape the future of human work itself and is already decimating suburbia. Amazon also holds massive government contracts and specifically military contracts. To top it all off, Bezos decided to buy the nation's second most important newspaper, rendering it toothless in terms of holding him or his companies to account and providing a ready-made propaganda arm for any legislation or rival company that could threaten his perch. Is it good for America to have someone with so much cash that they can buy up the vital organs of our democracy as casually as you and I might buy a coffee? Or let's talk about the world of philanthropy. Here's what Bloomberg had to say recently about his great generosity. Elizabeth Warren suggested you're trying to buy the election. Bernie Sanders says, as a billionaire, you can run even the dumbest person on the earth and pay for it. You see well, the no, point they're all making. I, I, yeah, the point they're making is it's okay a lot of money. if they, no. What the point they're making is it's okay if they ask other people for all their money and it will help their careers. Whereas if somebody goes out and makes the money themselves and gives it away, I give an enormous, virtually all my income goes to public health issues and education and the arts and the environment, things that I care about. And I think I could do a lot of good for the country if I could become president. And so using some of those monies to fund the campaign is fine. Just so generous of him. Now, let's be clear. Sure, it's good that he's giving money. But why should we all be dependent on bowing and scraping to billionaires, hoping to induce donorgasms that get the charitable giving <laughs> flowing in a beneficial direction? Why should the needy causes of the country be wholly dependent on whatever happens to strike the fancy of Mike Bloomberg or Jeff Bezos or Charles Koch? And by the way, billionaires aren't nearly as generous as they may have you believe. According to research by Gabriel Zuckman, Americans' wealthiest multi-billionaires only gave 0.94% of their net worth to charity in 2018. Oh, thank you, benevolent monarchs. All of this, of course, is to say nothing of the intergenerational effects of passing down that much wealth to your kids, creating a permanent class of untouchable American royalty. To all those who say, well, if you create a great company, you deserve to be a billionaire. What about their entitled, never worked a day offspring? Do they also deserve all those billions? Honestly, the whole idea that some people deserve billions while other people deserve to break their back every single day, never ever getting ahead, living by the whims of their overlords and constantly in peril of falling off the edge due to an illness or a broken down car, frankly, I find that view absolutely abhorrent. But let's say you don't. Let's say the morality that AOC describes so well of a system that would create billions for some and dystopian nightmare for others doesn't bother you. Well, even then, just take a look again at those ad spend dollars. Even the most committed capitalists ought to realize that if you want to have a country where you can prosper and flourish, this type of world historic inequality and ability to brazenly buy our elections is deeply corrosive and destructive to civil society. As even Alan Greenspan admitted, this is not the type of thing which a democratic society, a capitalist democratic society can really accept without addressing. And indeed, it will be addressed one way or another. Um, these numbers floored me. Yeah. Even no. though we knew it. But you look at the comparison, Bernie Sanders, 8.6. That's a lot of money. <laughs> but it doesn't even come close. It's nothing. It doesn't even touch. I mean, look. Bloomberg is at what, 5%, right? He's 5% in yeah. the national polls. I take a little bit Steyer, of Steyer, 9% uh, in one of the polls we saw absolutely. recently. I, I do. I think you're raising a great point about oligarchy and money and control. And again, though, and I'm going to talk a lot about this a little bit later, I think it comes down to economic structure. Yeah. And so to me, the question isn't like, should billionaires exist? I think it should be around what type of wealth is actually created in our society. So the true. truth is, half the people on the billionaire list are people who, in the hedge fund, private equity, and Wall Street industries, who create nothing, produce nothing, and have made all of their wealth by extracting it from the center of the country, offshoring it to China, working in league with authoritarian governments, and in some cases, even betting on the collateralized debt of foreign nations. I think that's abhorrent, right? So to me, it's much more about wealth in this country should be created by creating something that advocates the national interest. And part of that national interest is workers. Yeah. It's about 
creating an equitable society. And that's what we don't live in. Like, look at Michael Bloomberg. Michael Bloomberg is what, the ninth, tenth, whatever richest man in America. How did he create that money, $52 billion, by making financial transactions more efficient? Are all right. we all better Thanks, off? Thanks, Mike. Is the country better <laughs> off for that? You can be like, oh, well, American investors can now invest easily. Yeah, so can Chinese ones. Great. And you know what? Bloomberg is allowing Americans in order to invest into Chinese capital funds. Well, so this is this is what I'm trying to get at, which yeah. is like, this is a much bigger question about who we decide to allow to have power in our economy. That's it. And right now, it's finance. And finance is pushing the rest of us down. That's exactly right. And yeah. that's part of it. And then the other part of it is a structural system where all of the benefits flow to the top and leave everybody right. else behind. And that kind of disparity, again, is just so deeply destructive to a democracy. It really is not a sustainable or situation that we should accept whatsoever. No, it's not. Sagar, looking forward to your radar. That's next.